much for it. Thank you. And, uh, it, I think it's the first time that, that I speak to a crowd consisting of a gradient from, from high school students to distinguished professors from all over the world. So I think this is, a, this is just a wonderful collection of, of people. I'm, I'm very happy that I can, uh, can speak to you. I have prepared a lecture that uh, I, try, uh, I try to make as understandable as possible. So you don't have to have any uh, previous understanding of the issue, which may make it boring for some of the highly distinguished professors. On the other hand, I hope that, that really everyone can, uh, can follow it. And it's about a topic that I really like, not to say that I am obsessed with it uh, over the last years. And this is in part because I'm, I have been preparing a book that will come out next year with Princeton University Press that is about this issue. It's about critical transitions. So what is a critical transition? A critical transition is, for instance, if you're in a canoe and you see something very interesting in the water. I'm a, a water ecologist, so that happens often. And you lean over, you want to see it better and better, and then you become unstable till the point that you're close to a tipping point. And even a, a minor wave or a hiccup or something can tip you over. So critical transitions are sudden big changes that happen because you reach an instability, a tipping point in a system. And for the canoe, everybody knows that. But would that happen in economy? Would that happen in the ocean, in the climate maybe? That's not so obvious. So I've been thinking and reading and modeling and puzzling a lot about this question. And I think we really live in, in great times for, for this issue. Some people may say we live in the worst of times. But if you're a scientist and you're interested in change, change in complex system, we really live in the best of times. Because there is a lot of change. And many of you will be very familiar with this kind of graphs which show that from 1750 till now, like the damming of rivers has increased, the human population increased, all kinds of things increased, McDonald's restaurants, uh, <laughs> the number of motor vehicles, a linear increase since the 50s almost. But those graphs never, they never really speak to me. You know, graphs are boring in a sense. And it's, to me, it only comes alive when I think of the human dimension, in this case of, of my family. And this is a picture taken in 1921 of my great-grandfather. He was an amateur naturalist. He really loved bird watching and uh, finding out which mushroom species he could find. That was his hobby. His profession was family doctor. And to move from one patient to the other, the blacksmith in the, in the little town where he lived had constructed this vehicle. It's a dog-powered vehicle. The dog would go here. And he could go really fast from one patient to another one if it was necessary. There was an emergency. He could uh, hunk the horn that he had, and it, it, it went pretty well. And he was happy with that, but he really wanted a new invention, which was the car, the combustion engine, the fossil-fueled car. And there were only a few of those starting to come to Holland. And he wanted to buy one, but he wasn't allowed by the mayor of the city to drive the car because the mayor thought it was really outrageously dangerous to have in the city. But he insisted for years and eventually he was allowed to buy a car. He was the first one in the little town to have a, a fossil fuel driven car. And you can see he was really happy with that. He lost some hairs in the meantime, but that is a <laughs> genetic thing. We lose them very quickly in our, in our family. Now you may think that's a, that's a long time ago, the start of cars, right? It's now a, a major thing in the world. But it's not such a long time ago, if you think about it. So that's my great-grandfather. That's his son. That's his granddaughter. And this is his great-grandson. And as you can imagine, that's me, <laughs> right? I'm looking into the eyes of the guy that had the first car, or one of the first cars in Holland. It's not so long ago. Things change rapidly. And now I have children a son and a daughter, 
and that makes you think about the future, right? So what, will, what change will they see in their lives? Will it be the same kind of change that my great-grandfather saw? My great-grandfather lived in, in an empty world. <laughs> Very few people with what we call small ecological footprints. The people didn't have a large impact on the planet. They didn't burn fossil fuels in their car, for instance. But my children live in a very different world, a world with much more people, and each of those people has a much larger ecological footprint. So that's the, that's the whole story of global change. It has two sides. We get more people, and the people have higher consumption, higher impact on the planet. So things change. We change the planet. And this is the most famous change of all, perhaps. It's the increase in CO2 levels of the atmosphere, which happened to start in the year when I was born, 1958. And it's a, it's a linear crease, increase. We change the composition of the atmosphere, and you know this is an, a major driver of climatic change. And we drive a lot of change. There is more nutrients, more phosphorus, more nitrogen in the world. Uh, we change all kinds of things. And the main point is uh, we are here now. This is the point where I put my children on the world. And it's very interesting to think what will be next. Right? We see this, this change. So that's you know, global change. You hear it all the time, but it's interesting. We're in the middle of it. What's next? And I'm an ecologist, and to me, uh, one of the basic questions professionally is how will this change, this change in nutrients, in temperature, uh, in the weather, how will it affect the equilibrium of nature? How will nature change? Of course, we first have to <coughs> ask, what is the equilibrium of nature? Does it exist? Not really. If you look, for instance, at anchovies and sardines, and you look over time, this is a time series from 1960 till 2000, out the coast of Peru, you see it goes up and down. You get more anchovies, and then they crash. And then you get sardines, and then they crash, and then you get anchovies. Why? Is this the equilibrium of nature? Why does it behave so wildly? And you don't see only this thing in the, in the sardines and the anchovies. You see it in, in the beetles in the forest here. You see it in all kinds of things. Nature isn't very constant. Well, you could think maybe it's overfishing. They overfished the anchovies, and then came the sardines, which is part of the story. But you can reconstruct this change for thousands of years, looking at the ocean sediments, looking at the fish scales, and then you see that it has happened long before we started fishing. So what can it be? The weather, maybe. Maybe some years are good years for the sardines, other years are good years for the anchovies. And because of that, it changes all the time. That's hard to prove. How should you prove that? Scientifically, the best thing is to switch off the weather. Make the weather, the temperature, the rain, everything the same every day. And then see if it still happens. We can't do it to the ocean, but it's a, a nice thing in aquatic ecology that you can make very small ecosystems. These are ecosystems that have many species of plankton. And we can put them in a situation with constant light, constant temperature, everything constant. So what happens? Do we then see the equilibrium of nature? Will it stabilize? Surprise, surprise, it doesn't. Those are different species of uh, plankton, of bacteria, uh, over 10 years of time. A German called Heerklaus has had one of those systems, and two times a week, he studied what was in the system for 10 years without stopping. And he kept it under constant condition.